Hello everyone, today we are talking about the key differences between Windows and Linux because if you're a new user to Linux and you're thinking about using Linux for the first time it's good to know what the differences are, what you can expect. There are 13 things I'm going to cover today in today's video and uh, we'll start off with the first one which is the licensing model. So uh, Windows, uh, whilst most people get Windows free when they buy their computer it isn't actually free, it's just the price is included in the um, price of the computer or device that you're purchasing. Uh, if you buy a computer without Windows on it and you want to put Windows on, then you have to pay for a license to use that software. Whereas Linux, in the main, it's free to install and free to use, although there are some distributions that ask for a donation to help keep them going. Other main difference between uh, Windows and Linux in terms of uh, licensing is the philosophy of, of the operating system. So uh, Windows is closed source. All the source code belongs to Microsoft and the only people that can change their source code for Windows are Microsoft employees themselves. Obviously people can build applications on top of Windows because that's how the ecosystem works. but. Uh, Windows itself, the source code is locked down. Uh, Linux, on the other hand, it's an open source software operating system. All the software in it, the source code is freely available for you to fork and amend and modify and distribute yourself. And it's distributed under what is known as the GNU General Public License, uh, which promotes uh, free software use and collaboration. So number two on the list is the user interface. So, so the Windows graphical interface is consistent across uh, all the versions. The, generally there's a start button, a taskbar, desktop icons, a menu, and uh, it's designed to be familiar to um, users that have grown up using Microsoft products over the years. So most, most people will know the look and feel of Windows. Linux on the other hand, you have a lot of choice of how the desktop environment looks and how your GUI looks. You can use different desktop environments like GNOME or KDE, XFCE, LXQT, Cinnamon, Pantheon etc. And you can configure the hell out of it. You can make it look exactly how you want it to. In fact you can make it look like Windows or even Mac OS if you want to um, go down that route. Uh, number three on the list uh, is the file system structure. So in Windows you have uh, NTFS as a primary file system. Uh, uh, you, it also supports FAT and FAT32 and XFAT, uh, but generally speaking, when you install Windows, it creates an NTFS partition and your drives are labeled C and D and E, etc. Now, the, the history of that is the A drive used to be for a floppy disk, uh, and then the B drive used to be for the second floppy disk. And then the C drive was for the hard drive, and then D drive was for a, a CD ROM. So obviously, floppy disks stopped being a thing, um, but they never renamed it from C to A for your hard drive. So floppy disks would still be A and B, and then you've got all the other drives like E, F, G, and all like that. Um, they can either be other partitions on drives, or they can be network drives, etc. Linux, on the other hand, has multiple different file system types. Uh, for instance, ext4, uh, btrfs, xfs, G um, general file systems, etc. And instead of using drive letters like cde, etc., they there are different naming conventions. Uh, so you might have sda, sdb, sdc, etc. For each of the uh, drives, and uh, then the partitions might have a number after it. So you might have SDA1, SDA2, but then they're not necessarily set in stone as being SDA. It's also worth noting that the file system for Windows should start under C colon, and then all your system files would be in the Windows system folder, whereas in Linux you start at the root folder, which is just denoted by a forward slash, and then you've got all the uh, system files in directories like uh, bin, usr, uh, etc. So number four on the list is software and package management. Uh, so Windows, the the installers are called MSI files and so you generally click on the MSI and that brings up the installer and you step through the installer and then uh, the actual applications you run are usually uh, .exe which are executables and to, to get the software you can either 
download it from a vendor's website or you can go onto the Microsoft Store to install the applications. Linux uh, again is all about choice so you have uh, different file formats so you might have the Debian file format you might have the RPM format uh, you might have snaps uh, which are containerized formats and then you've got flat packs as well which are also containerized uh, and Linux uses a whole load of different package managers so you've got apt for Debian Ubuntu and then you've got yum and DNF and Fedora you've got Pac-Man for Arch etc and then you've got different graphical store installers as well so you've got the GNOME software manager the KDE discover tool and various other things like that number five on the list uh, we, we have to talk about security so Microsoft uh, Windows is susceptible to viruses and malware and ransomware um, that's there's two reasons for that really I mean a lot of people say it's because it's more popular but it's also the fact that it's not as secure as Linux uh, in terms of the the securing much in terms of the security model that's in place uh, so Windows requires regular updates uh, you need antivirus software and you definitely need firewall protection now it, it's not a bad idea to have firewall protection on Linux either uh, you, you do get less malware because um, it's less targeted to Linux and antivirus software on Linux is a bit hit and miss anyway so generally speaking I don't think for home use you need it uh, it's con it is considered more secure uh, it's because of the way the permissions work um, th the user base of Linux is generally people who are more tech savvy anyway and uh, because it's open source uh, you've got people looking at the code all the time and they all spot if there's any security holes obviously that's a two-way street because if uh, the average Joe can spot a security hole then um, a world famous hacker might be able to find it as well so number six on the list is customization and flexibility so Windows is fairly locked down you can't customize too much you can change the background obviously you can um, probably change um, a few things to do with the way it looks and feels but generally speaking you've you, you, it's kind of set in stone that this is the way Windows looks this is the way it works uh, use it Linux um, you've got multiple desktop environments and it, even within a desktop environment you can customize them to the way you want them to look so if I take XFCE for an example you can customize that to make it look any way you want it to it really is so easy to do there's different desktop environments window managers you can theme it uh, different ways of doing panels, you can add widgets, you can add, add conkey to show system statistics etc. Uh, Linux is just highly customizable. Now uh, the way I've been talking thus far everything is Windows is locked down costly and bad and um, Linux is everything that's great and that's obviously I, I'm a little bit biased because I'm a Linux user but there are some things where Windows are probably um, better than Linux uh, hardware compatibility if you think about new devices that come out on the market so say you're releasing a new graphics card you're gonna write it f the drivers for the biggest audience and the biggest audience are Windows users so you create the, the drivers for the Windows audience and therefore that that piece of hardware is more likely to work on Windows than it is on Linux uh, but Linux usually gets compatible drivers um, not not too long afterwards is they're either open sourced or um, the the companies themselves will produce um, a Linux based driver all it means is if you buy the brand new hardware device there is a chance that it may not be compatible with the version of Linux that you're using and uh, but it, this isn't quite as bad as it used to be but it's, it's, it's still something to worth thinking about if you're thinking about moving to Linux uh, number eight on the list is to do with the command line uh, so Windows unless you're a developer um, you have very little need to go into the command line most people don't bother uh, I, don't, I guess that most people don't even know what the, the, that there is a command line in Windows um, you know they, they go on they look at their Facebook they do their work even uh, in their offices and they have no reason to go into the into the command line at all now the command line um, you've got a command prompt and you've got PowerShell and PowerShell is quite powerful but it's nowhere near as powerful as the Linux command line uh, and the command line is central to the use of Windows at all so 
like I said before, you can use Windows without touching the command line uh, most of the time. Linux, on the other hand, uh, the command line is more prevalent. It, it used to be the case that you can get anywhere with Linux without using the command line, but I would say with in the last few years there's so many distributions out there that you could probably do most of the th things that you need to do without using the terminal at all. Uh, in Linux the command line is called the terminal and there's different shells that you can use so you can use bash scripting, zsh, you know, fish, there's all sorts of different uh, scripting languages you can use all based around shell scripts and unix and uh, by and large, if you if you get advice from people on the internet of how to do certain things, they'll direct you to to the command line because it's easy to tell somebody to do something via the command line once, than have a an example for every single desktop environment and every single um, configuration that there is. Because Linux is so highly configurable, trying to talk somebody through how to do something graphically isn't as easy as it is to say open a terminal window and type in this command. Uh, the next on the list, number nine, is performance. Uh, so I think it's widely known that Linux um, performs better than Windows. Um, it works on harder. Uh, Linux works better on older hardware. Now, Windows is more resource intensive, but you can actually cut it down and turn off um, non essential services, turn off animations and stuff like that, and it does become quite usable. Uh, it never gets to the level of Linux though, so if you've got a really old piece of hardware, um, Linux will still run on it. Now, uh, the desktop environment that you use might not look as pretty, um, it may not look as nice as your Windows and stuff when you do that, but it will still work. Now you can't, now you can't pull a rabbit out of a hat like a magician, um, if, if the computer is 20 years old and it's only got one gigabyte of RAM, you're, you're not going to be um, surfing the internet and watching YouTube. It's just not going to happen. If you haven't got a graphics card, you're not going to be playing the latest and the greatest games. That's just not how it works. But if you if you just do a bit of web browsing or you want to type some documents, then you can still make that computer you, useful by using lightweight versions of Linux. The only way to do that with Windows is use a very old version of Windows, and then that's not very secure because they, they're not getting updates, whereas the Linux yeah, equivalents will be. So number 10 uh, on the list is community and support. So generally speaking with Windows, um, for applications you're going to get support from the vendors of those applications. For Windows itself you're going to get uh, support from the Microsoft website uh, and you get official updates, patches, custom support services, but I don't know if you've ever used the Microsoft website. If you've ever asked a question on the Microsoft website, it is horrendous. They never seem to answer the question, ever. Now you can phone up and stuff like that, and if you pay for support, you can do it that way. I would say the best thing to come out uh, in the last few years for support purposes is ChatGPT. Uh, it really, if you've got a problem nowadays, whether it's with Windows or Linux, type it into ChatGPT, and it will usually come up with a reasonable answer and at least point you in the general direction that you need to be looking. Uh, so Linux support, on the other hand, is very strong, very active. There are um, IRC channels, there's forums, there's websites, there's wikis, uh, there's Facebook groups, there's Reddit groups. Uh, there's so much support for, for Linux. And again, if you really get stuck, chat GPT works and Google's Gemini works as well. Uh, I've tried that re uh, recently as well. So almost there now, number 11 and uh, we're talking about software availability so uh, this is one of the key ones uh, and something you should really think about before moving to Linux uh, so Windows runs most commercial software and most commercial games enterprise applications are for Windows uh, uh, business applications like Microsoft Office, Adobe um, you've got Photoshop um, things like that they all run on Windows and depending on your hardware it depends how well they run on on those computers. For Linux, a l not all applications work on Linux. Generally speaking though, where there's an application uh, that runs on Windows, there's an alternative that runs on Linux. And whether it's as good as the one that you want to be using, like for instance, whether the GNU Image Manipulation Program, otherwise known as GIMP, 
um, works as well as Photoshop? Um, possibly not. But it's worth noting nowadays that a lot of these applications, there's cloud versions appearing um, and they run via your web browser and they're actually getting really, really good. And even if you want to use Microsoft Office as an uh, Office Online version, now there are perfectly good um, Office applications for Linux. Uh, LibreOffice is, is one. I mean, for home use, I can't see how LibreOffice isn't as good as Microsoft Office. It does near enough everything. And you've also got Google Docs. There's other th tools as well, like Only Office and Kingsoft Office and uh, etc. So I think. Um, Generally speaking, not everything's going to work on Linux that, that, that you want to use. So Adobe products, for instance, aren't going to work. DaVinci Resolve and things like that, I don't think they necessarily work. And gaming's obviously a bit of a problem. Not all games work on Linux. Uh, and even the ones that do, they're not native to Linux, so they might not be quite as good. Um, but it has improved because of Steam. Uh, a lot of these games are now coming to Linux using the Proton package, and they are actually... Uh, improving every single day so uh, I wouldn't hold off using Linux if you're a gamer because you might find the game you're wanting to play does actually work. Uh, number 12 uh, is cost so typically Windows you have to pay for a license I know a lot of people get their, their operating system with their computers so they don't realize they have paid for that license uh, but you you like say you're on Windows 8 and you want Windows 10 or 11 you probably have to pay for a license for it now so um, it's not free and the more computers you have the more licenses you have to pay for Linux is free to download free to use free to modify and most distributions are available at no cost whatsoever like I said before though some of them do ask for a donation it's quite a good thing to do that if you've used it for a while because it you know encourages further support of that operating system and finally number 13 uh, updates and this is the big one windows updates are horrendous uh, they're managed through microsoft windows update tool and they force the updates on you uh, and whilst they are are limited options to tailor how often you get those updates and which updates you're getting um, when Windows decides to update, it's going to update. So if you've got a concert that you want to go to and the tickets are on your machine and you, you happen to turn your computer on and it's decided to update and you need to be at that concert in an hour, it will suddenly start saying, updating one of 364. And then it'll go 1%, 2%. Then 20 minutes later, and you're thinking, I need to get these tickets printed out and they're not happening. And that for me is the biggest letdown that Windows ever has is that it doesn't let you pause an update or cancel an update it just it does it it says I'm doing it tough Linux on the other hand you have a lot more control over updates yes updates happen generally they they happen and you can continue working whilst the updates are happening in the background I have noticed more and more though that um, there are certain operating systems that when you do updates they are asking for reboots now um, but and some of them are actually updating when you're booting up as well which um, I find a little bit annoying but in, in the main updates happen in the background and you can continue using the app, uh, the operating system role and release distributions um, provide constant updates so they update regularly uh, whereas fixed release distributions like Ubuntu um, they have period periodic updates and uh, so if you really don't like updates that much go for Debian stable because they their updates are very few and far between and that's really the end of the video um, I hope you like it if you did hit the like button um, hit the subscribe button and I'll see you next time on everyday Linux user